Hello, everybody, and warm welcome to the Cyber Policy Center webinar. For a lot of you, this will be a welcome back because we did something unusual. Um, two weeks ago, we hosted a webinar with the same speakers as today, plus uh, one other speaker who couldn't make it today, unfortunately. Um, but we had such a lively and um, interesting discussion about the Digital Services Act and the Digital Market Act, these twin legislative proposals on the table uh, in the European Union in Brussels, that uh, it felt like the many questions that were posed in the Q&A could not properly be addressed and that there was really room to dig deeper. And so uh, I'm incredibly grateful that our speakers agreed immediately uh, to join us again for this follow up. So what I hope is that uh, all of you participating now were either there last time and have seen the, um, uh, the introductions and the session last time uh, live or were able to watch the video recap, which uh, was available on YouTube. And I know hundreds of people have watched. So what we're going to do today is I'll give the floor very briefly to the three speakers to either pick a question that was unanswered, add a thought that they couldn't really share uh, last time, or you know, build on, on um, a thought that they've had since, but really invite you to use the Q&A function to put your questions there so that we can make this next hour as interactive as possible. Now, very briefly, for those of you who didn't see the program or who weren't there uh, last time, my name is Marietje Schaak. I'm the International Policy Director at the Cyber Policy Center at Stanford. We will first hear from Guillermo Beltra, who is the EU Digital Policy Lead at Open Society's European Policy Institute. Then we'll hear from Joris van Hoboken, Professor of Law at the Free University in Brussels, and also affiliated with the Institute for Information Law in Amsterdam. And last but not least, we go back to our home base uh, to hear from Daphne Keller, who directs the program on platform regulation with us at the Cyber Policy Center uh, and has a lot of experience also in the private sector working with these issues. So without further ado, Guillermo, take it away. Thank you, Maricha. Thank you for inviting us once again and welcome everybody. Um, just to maybe give us some context uh, about where, where all of this is coming from and why the EU is doing this. I think it's important to remember, and we talked about this profusely two weeks ago, um, that these two pieces of law are trying to regulate some actors in the digital economy that not only have an impact on the markets that surround them and on individuals, but they have an impact on society as a whole. We're seeing that these uh, online platforms that these two laws try to address have um, are, are a total lack of accountability and transparency about how they operate. Um, there's a widespread business model based on surveillance. There's a, a strong consolidation of power. Um, they are uh, often responsible for amplifying this information and so-called hate speech. And we see how these erodes cornerstone institutions of our democracies. Now, um, the first message for us that's important to flag is that the EU is right to address these issues with two pieces of law. One, the DSA that tries to update uh, now 21 year old framework uh, that was made for another age of the internet and still maintaining some of its principles like we discussed two weeks ago, it, it's adding a lot of novelties that I hope we can discuss some more today through your questions. And then the other one, the Digital Markets Act, which is just directly aimed at the power of a handful of companies that are now the kingmakers uh, inside these markets. And one important observation that we didn't talk about uh, two weeks ago um, is that it's just a sheer manifestation of uh, how widespread uh, how widespread the impact of these laws could be to see just how many communities of civil society groups are engaging on these debates from the consumer protection com uh, community to the digital rights groups community, democracy groups, media groups, racial justice groups. Uh, groups defending other vulnerable communities. They are all looking at what the EU is doing here and saying, okay, how does this affect the interests of my communities? Um, and that's just testimony as ha at how impactful this could be. Um, one suggestion that I would bring to our conversation today that we didn't zoom into uh, last time was to look into one of the bigger novelties in the DSA, which is this risk assessment and mitigation regime for very large online platforms that the commission has put as an idea on top of the, on top of the table. 
Um, I'm sure many of you will have sort of alarms ringing and saying like, how is this all going to work? How does this interplay with a lot of other elements? Um, I would love to discuss what are the intentions behind this? What you all think about this? Um, and then the other issue that is important for us that we're thinking about is, um, and that I briefly mentioned two weeks ago is the Digital Markets Act is a market regulation tool in essence. Its objectives are purely economic. It looks into questions of market power and how it can address that. It does not, in, its, in how it's built, look into how those issues would impact society more broadly or democracy or, or the quality of political discourse, for, for example. So one question for us is how do they, the two proposals work together? Because the DSA does have that broader societal scope in mind, but the DMA doesn't. So very looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you. Thanks, Guillermo. Over to you, Oris. Yes, th those were really great points, uh, Guillermo. And so like, like the others, I think I really enjoyed the last uh, round. I'm super happy to be, uh, to be here again. I want to, I want to maybe just um, uh, take one step back and look at in particular the DSA um, and, 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 and just acknowledge the complexity uh, of, uh, of the proposal. Uh, so in a way, you know, you could say it's a fairly simple kind of scoped uh, set of rules. This is like, this is Europe's kind of platform regulation uh, proposal. This is about regulating platforms in the digital uh, age. It's Europe's kind of way of dealing with this uh, new uh, form uh, of power that has emerged. And, and, and so that is, it's fairly like cleanly scoped and, so what are those rules going to be? If you look at it from like a kind of what, what already exists in terms of law, uh, it just intersects with so many different legal areas and it has so many different kind of legal types of mechanisms included in it and adds uh, some new ones uh, to the mix uh, as well. So is the intermediary liability, which is really strong kind of like civil law uh, backgrounds, tort law type of principles underneath it. It's the fundamental rights protection that is very crucial. There are media regulation and new forms of media regulation included in them. Uh, they're very strong, of course, economic regulation and market regulation components, especially also if you look at it like in conjunction uh, with the DSA. There are new forms of, you know, public regulatory oversights, you know, like are being uh, proposed. And, and a whole range of like, you know, existing kind of regulators are maybe all going to have like some role to play with respect to enforcement and the coordination of that enforcement is gonna be very crucial. So I think it's really, it's ultimately, if you look at it from, from a legal and regulatory perspective, it's a very, very complex uh, piece of, uh, piece of uh, legislation that is, uh, that is being put forward um, with, uh, where a lot of coordination will have to happen, you know, in, in understanding, you know, how all these different kind of areas of law and approaches in law and regulation intersect uh, with each other. And I think that is, that is going to be a real challenge. In the, in the project that we have started at the European, at the uh, University of Amsterdam, the DSA Observatory, we are trying to, you know, use some of those kind of more broader regulatory perspectives, you know, economic regulation or, media regulation where you know media concentration rules for instance and things like that are interesting to look at the regulation of you know illegal content online where we see also kind of a deep deputization of platforms you know the privatized enforcement paradigm being you know actually being furthered by the proposal and look at those kind of general perspective to understand what is at stake uh, in the DSA proposal and to understand also you know, how, what are the trade-offs uh, between those different approaches? Because, I mean, you can try to throw everything that looks good in one bag and hope that so, like something beautiful comes out of it. Uh, but I think we all know that like it's very important also to create focus and 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 to to make choices. You know, in in, in how to structure regulation and to keep it also as clean as uh, as possible. So let me keep it with that for my starting remarks. Uh, thank you again for having me. Thank you, Joris, and thanks for all the questions coming in. Daphne, over to you. Um, 
So I guess I would kind of echo how Yoris framed this, that there's a batch of <clears throat> issues that people who worked on the e-commerce directive and intermediary liability before are familiar with, and, and they resurface here. And then there's another batch that are very new and very, you know, systemic and, and will make for um, important changes, um, including to sort of regulatory oversight and um, government institutions. Some of the things, I'll, I'll name a few things in each of those buckets just to get a little more concrete. Um, the things that I see as carryovers from existing debates include in particular um, questions about when and how authorities can require platforms to proactively monitor user content. This is something that was sort of a, a statutory language question under Article 15 of the e-commerce directive and simultaneously a human rights and fundamental rights question about expression rights, privacy rights, rights against discrimination, rights to fair process, et cetera, that are affected by um, automated content moderation decisions. Um, and you know, the latest answer we have on that is in the CJEU's Facebook Ireland case, but which didn't speak to the fundamental rights questions at all. And the um, DSA kind of takes that existing question in the posture in which it already stands and just continues it, you know? So, so we all get to um, continue engaging with that question. Similarly, the, you know, there, there are questions like in Article 6 about what does it mean to say platforms don't lose immunity solely because of their content moderation efforts? Does it mean they might lose immunity because of those efforts? Um, in Article 12, what, what is diligent enforcement of a toss and, and who decides and how does that affect liability? Um, in Article 14, can a notice that doesn't adequately substantiate the allegations that it makes nonetheless create actual knowledge um, for purposes of, of taking away immunity from the platform? I think the answer to that is that textually it apparently does, but there have been strong signals from the commission that that was not the intent. And, and so hopefully that, that will change. Um, the moving from kind of the familiar things to the things that are really new, um, you know, obviously one of the biggest is this significant regulatory apparatus for the very large online platforms. Um, and that's both, you know, novelty in the platforms themselves having to conduct risk assessments and undergo audits and submit reports. Um, and also in terms of setting up or um, repurposing existing national regulators and finding ways for them to work together in a way that's kind of reminiscent of um, how DPAs work together um, under the GDPR or how media regulators work together to a lesser degree under umbrella groups like Ergon now. Um, the other big new things I would flag are the mandatory participation in new private dispute resolution processes that I think um, needs the tires kicked on it a lot and is very complicated and very interesting. Um, and then finally, something kind of tucked away and I almost, I'm not sure how deliberate this was, is in article 15, there's a mention of um, the commission maintaining a database of the notifications that platforms send users to explain what content they took down and why. If you pair that, um, fascinating reference to an amazing new database with the transparency obligations that are spread across probably five different articles throughout the DSA. It suggests some emerging, you know, very ambitious new way of um, surfacing structured data for researchers and the public and for government about platform content moderation. That is simultaneously fascinating and um, intimidatingly ambitious. <laughs> um, so I hope there will be much more detailed discussion of that going forward. Thank you so much, Daphne. Um, and thank you for the questions. We're gonna dive right in. Uh, Ilika Ivanova asked a question, um, what, would we, what could we expect as lobbying efforts from Dot .Europe? And just to illustrate how quickly the Brussels bubble changes, I didn't know what Dot .Europe was, but it's actually formerly edema. Uh, so, uh, for all of you who had also missed the dot Europe uh, innovation going on there. Um, Guillermo, I think you, you were happy to share a few thoughts, but uh, you also and Daphne, you're also welcome to reflect on lobbying efforts, what you're seeing and hearing in terms of the high stakes, uh, corporate, but also civil society, academia, perhaps because of the access to information parts. Uh, I think it will be um, uh, 
a battle for the most intense lobbying compared to previous files, but we'll see. Guillermo, what do you think? So, so maybe just to share, like uh, to, to zoom out, out out for a second, what we're seeing, I think the commission in the consultations preceding these two proposals received over 1,200 or so responses to the public consultation. It was massive. I heard that they had to set up some sort of automated system to actually read through them or to help read through all of the through all of the responses, um, which means it just gives you an idea of just how much attention this is getting, not just from civil society, but of course across academia, industries, and so on. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, from a civil society standpoint, there is a lot of uh, historical expertise um, on questions related to speech governance, speech and content governance. And there are quite a, lo a large number of actors that are keeping a close eye on how these conversations develop. So that's great. On the Digital Markets Act, on the other hand, unfortunately, there is not so much expertise in civil society writ large about technical economic regulation and competition issues. Um, and so there, one of the things that we as OSF, for example, look into is how can we help uh, civil society get better involved in those conversations. Um, on the question of dot Europe, and obviously not speaking on behalf of them, but just my sense from what I see, considering the membership that that trade association has, I would imagine that their focus of action will be the DSA. And I would hypothesize that probably two big things are important for them. One, for those uh, members of Dot Europe that are not captured by, in principle, the definition of very large online platform to make sure that that stays that way. Uh, because of course, many small, medium and smaller platforms will want to uh, stay away from the sort of from the more onerous regime for the larger platforms. And then the second one, I think, is to be able to respond to many of the questions that Daphne was rightly posing is like they are, they're going to want legal certainty. Like once now the, the EU has opened this big Pandora box of reforming our platform rules, let's make sure, please, that what comes out of this actually has clear rules for all market actors, including themselves. Um, what I would imagine that the dot Europe will not uh, uh, do a lot of work on is the DMA, on the other hand, just because I would imagine that there, their inter the interests of their members might collide. Thank you. Any other additional thoughts or on to the next question? Next question. Um, I, I think maybe, maybe one point I think that like I would expect uh, not so much. I mean, there's there's an interest and, and going back to my previous remarks, there's an interesting mix of more rights based approaches and like possibilities for individual complaints and legal process. And I mean, we have developments also in member states where you have, you know, free speech rights to have your, your content be reinstated. And, and, and this is very much in individual cases, you have a legal process that everybody can, you know, appeal to. And, and this is, of course, this is, this can be very costly. And, and, you know, th those types of uh, issues are, you know, managing that type of uh, regulatory complexity is quite hard. I would imagine that we would see uh, like more emphasis on, you know, solutions that have to do with, you know, the type of, you know, like risk assessments and audits and things that don't necessarily, I mean, that can create value, uh, but uh, don't directly kind of create liability uh, in all these types of individual cases as well. That is my intuition that is uh, you see a bit more emphasis on that. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, to Nate Persley's question, quote, with respect to content moderation, how might the Digital Services Act change platform behavior related to something in Europe akin to the Capitol riot and Trump takedown? In other words, if a similar situation happened in a European capital and platforms were being used to promote disinformation that arguably was leading to offline harm, would the platforms have different obligations than they do now? If in response, they took down the account of a government leader, what new legal risks might they be exposing themselves to? Is it a trick question? I mean, I'll take a quick stab at that. Um, I think with reference to disinformation generally, 
uh, a lot of that is addressed in the the disinformation code of conduct, so wouldn't necessarily come in through the DSA. But but certainly compared to the U.S., the number of things that might actually violate the law in Europe but not violate the law here is significant. And so the takedown obligations, just because of because of that substantive difference in in what speech is violates the law, um, I would expect to be greater already in Europe. And if the DSA leads to more enforcement of existing laws, which I think is part of the, the premise, um, then, then you would expect more takedown. Um, as to taking down Trump in particular, um, I think I mentioned, might have mentioned this last time, uh, I ran a Twitter survey um, of, I have a lot of very knowledgeable EU expert followers, so I think this is a meaningful survey. You know, what would be the outcome under the DSA? And there was like, a small number of people who are like, yes, definitely you'd have to take him down. And a small number who are like, no, definitely you wouldn't be able to take him down. And the vast majority were like, I don't know, but the process would be more legitimate, you know, because there is a mechanism to, to bring in regulators and potentially courts and, you know, basically to, to have um, democratically created decision makers be part of the process. Um, so I, I kind of think that's the real answer. Good one, yours. Yeah, I wanted to. I wanted to also to react to this. I want to take uh, uh, the question in a different direction. I think we have seen Merkel very publicly write about this, of course, about the, about the case, and also putting forward a very kind of European type of you know critique of what was happening. What's like a private company is making this type of decision without the legal process? How is this possible? Not necessarily contesting that it should have been like left up or something, but saying this process, it doesn't make sense. And by therefore implying, you know, we have to like work on this, you know, and the DSA is about to kind of set maybe some of the ground rules for that. But I think in the European capitals in particular, I mean, in the end, the member states are the most powerful uh, still in Europe, you know, even though the commission and the parliament would like otherwise. Um, I think it is that type of power dynamics that, you know, they might not be completely comfortable just kind of really passing it on to Europe to decide what the rules are going to be. And I think this is, uh, this is really a wake-up call from that kind of sovereignty perspective, from that kind of what kind of power are we going to have, you know, in our own member states to deal with these types of questions. So I think it's actually the Trump case for Europe and for the DSA is... Uh, for me, it's like foregrounding how difficult it will be to really agree at the European level on these types of rules for these new kind of power dynamics. Thank you. I want to take uh, Eleanor, Carmi, and Peter Lysai, Lisi's questions together because one deals with um, the question of enforcement of the two regulations, which you know the GDPR continues to teach us that um, enforcement is super important, uh, the capacity, um, the um, regulators, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then Peter asks, um, what could be the issues or areas in which the DSA, oops, it just jumped, and the DMA could be in conflict? And what could be possible loopholes for the dominant player? So enforcement and loopholes, how does that play out? Any thoughts? I mean, one interesting conflict that we have noted between the DSA and the DMA is that there's a bit of a dynamic in the DSA, what I mentioned earlier, of like, you know, deputizing the platforms. And I know from discussions in the terrorism content regulation that, you know, from the law enforcement side of things, they'd be quite happy if like the internet is just a handful of platforms they have to deal with. You know, like these concentration issues from a law enforcement perspective are not so problematic. They actually make things much more kind of, you know, it makes it somewhat easier to manage. You just have some uh, relationships and, and uh, to manage and not this kind of wide variety of possible places where things can pop up. So I think from a law enforcement perspective, concentration could be uh, a good thing. And, and it's, there's no concern about that. And I think from uh, the, the economic regulation, the DSA perspective, there's definitely a strong uh, concern about these types of concentrations and what they bring. And I think underlying the DMA is idea to break open some of these markets a bit more and to create more competition. The second set, and it's a bit related, 
you know, if you have all these kind of self-regulatory expectations and managing of risk and illegal content on the platforms, and it includes, you know, marketplaces, you know, what are marketplaces doing for, you know, unsafe products and all sorts of things that could cause harm, you know, and you put these kind of obligations or expectations on platform, they need some discretion to manage that. So what you see is, you know, those kind of regulatory expectations, you see it in the privacy field play out quite a bit, you know, like smartphone ecosystem, smartphone platforms, you know, they're going to remove apps saying, you know, they're infringing privacy rules, they're not compliant with GDPR, they're this and that. And so that creates, like it creates all sorts of stick to beat uh, with for the platform, and that can be used then to competitively, you know, and from a DMA perspective, that is considered problematic, and you're trying to create, create transparency, accountability, and fairness. But if you put all sorts of, you know, regulatory expectations on the platforms, you know, like, and that plays also out in the, in the disinformation context uh, as well, actually, you know, like you can't blame the platforms then for being restrictive and then having to need, needing also some discretion to, uh, to act. Thank you. I'm going to add a question following up on the Trump case from, from Frayn Marowicz who asks, uh, while it is clear that the DSA does not aim to regulate online content, but gives this responsibility to the EU member states, this seems to open the possibility of different internet content between EU member states. For example, content takedowns according to the German criminal code through NetsDG, and on the other hand, the upcoming Polish law that will prohibit takedown of anything that's legal in Poland. Does this mean that platforms will need to have different content in two neighboring EU states? I mean, I, I can speak a little bit to that. I think in the case of Google, where I used to work, and um, YouTube and Twitter and Facebook, they already do have differing content in neighboring EU member states because they honor legally mandatory takedown requirements you know, per national law and then show different content in, in different countries. The dynamic that you know, using geotargeting or other kind of proxies for physical location, typically, um, the the dynamic that I worry about there is that is expensive. You know, assessing something differently in France versus Poland um, requires paying a lawyer and maintaining a system that allows this differential targeting and and so forth. Um, and so it's always easier to just say, well, let's just expand our terms of service prohibitions so they prohibit a superset of what these different countries require. And then we don't ever have to ask about the law at all. We just ask about our terms of service, which are drafted to allow simple answers um, and will prohibit a little bit too much expression in every single country, but that's okay, we're allowed to do that. Um, and so that, that is one of the things I worry about most with every sort of nudging of platforms to do more things based on the law, if there is always an out by um, moving everything into the private domain and, and making it, um, you know, a monoculture across national borders, um, that, that is a way that platforms are likely to go. Uh, Haris Papavangelou asks, hello, and thanks for the second session. I was wondering if you think the DSA will affect the implementation or even alter the audiovisual media services directive. I'm thinking whether we focus too much on DSA as an e-commerce update and haven't really touched upon the media and the cultural implications of the proposed legislation. Any thoughts? Otherwise, we can treat it as a comment because uh, it was also sort of a comment. Uh, I'm going to move on to two related questions, or I hope so. Uh, Phil Stupak asks, a significant issue of concern is the EU's regulation of .com, the domain. It's entirely reasonable for the EU to regulate member state domains, .fr, .ir, uh, .de, etc. But once the EU engages in digital colonialism of .com, then there are significant concerns that the EU is undermining the rules of Westphalian sovereignty with a long arm jurisdiction that is not entirely appropriate. If the EU is going, EU is going to regulate facebook.com in lieu of facebook.com.fr, then how does the Westphalian state survive? I'm going to add to that Ali Humayun's question, who says, I was wondering if it could be possible to touch a bit further on the broader geopolitical implications. In particular, um, should the EU implement Australian style measures following the nation's recent proposal to make Google pay for news content? 
Would it be better to introduce similar reforms or would it be better for the EU um, to, um, or would it be better for the impact of the EU's new copyright rules to become more clear? Similarly, how might these proposals affect the EU's relationship with the UK after Brexit? So essentially, you know, how far can the EU go? Uh, is it appropriate? Would it have extraterritorial effects? Should it work with others or uh, stay within its own boundaries? And how does it implement or sorry, impact relations between nation states and the global internet? Big questions. Anyone, yeah. yours? Maybe you should abuse your position as moderator and chair, uh, Marietje, on this one. I mean, this seems like this seems to be. I would be very curious what uh, what, what your intuition is on on this. Um, to make, I mean, I'm I'm not I'm not fully like on the premise of the first question on the dot com. I I don't think. I mean, we have seen quite some complexity emerge over the years on how you know like states and and also something like the eu you know can can in can regulate you know in with respect to you know internet services dynamics on, on online platforms in the internet and i think there's always a certain amount of hesitation you know like but there's definitely much more uh confidence uh, to regulate also i think after the gdpr like kind of setting global standards but I, I, de I definitely think there's a realization you can't just like set, you know, you can't regulate everything in the world. So you see that yeah. also emerge in the case law uh, from the Court of Justice, you know, in recent uh, right to be forgotten decisions, you see, you know, like a realization that there needs to be a certain amount of balancing. But, but how exactly that uh, has to happen, it's not, it's not, it's not always so clear. It's, it's a very complicated well, I question. Yeah, I mean, I think the two questions, um, you know, beg the broader perspective of will democratic countries increasingly seek cooperation or, or you know, use each other's best practices to implement similar rules and, and thereby create as much as possible of a so-called level playing field. And uh, starting with the EU, I think generally the intention is to have rules apply to its citizens or yeah, you know, it's consumers based um, on, on the territory for sure. And I don't think one can claim, but this is just me speculating, that .com cannot be regulated because it is not, you know, uh, aligned with any kind of nation state. I mean, if that were the premise of domain names, you know, then the internet would have been much more fragmented to begin with. So um, I, I frankly think the EU will be agnostic about the domain name um, end, but rather will seek to identify who is either a citizen or a user for the purpose of the application of any regulation. Look at the GDPR uh, for some some indication there. Um, I, I want to pick. I would. Oh, oh, I go ahead. Think Here we go. go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I was just going to add that I think it's important to also remember that in addition to all this seemingly EU only processes with uh, about new laws that yes have a, a, a for, you know a global reach in the sense like Marichu was saying that companies have to comply with them if they are addressing their services at people inside the EU. In parallel to all of that, we see a lot of uh, conversations in the direction of setting up rules that would be, for example, transatlantic in nature, President von der Leyen, just days after President Biden took office, um, was talking about the need of having a sort of a transatlantic partnership or rules that, you know, to govern the digital space together. What that means is, is anybody's interpretation right now, but, you know, we need to see about that at the same time, lots of bilateral, regional and multilateral trade deals are looking increasingly into setting up norms for the digital space. And the EU is in those conversations as well. And so some of those, um, so all of this is happening in parallel and what the final picture would look like, I think is, is really hard to guess at this time. I, I would just add, I think there's a real difference between extraterritorial enforcement of the GDPR, which very, to, maybe speak too broadly, but broadly gives users more rights than they would have under their national laws, privacy rights, versus extraterritorial enforcement of content takedown mandates, which generally give users in other countries 
fewer rights than they would have under their national law. And so just as a matter of like conflicts of law jurisprudence or international public law or comity, I, I think those play out very differently. Um, and I, I think we've just seen a massive failure of transnational process here, right? Like the questions about when and how countries should um, issue orders or, or pass laws that, that bind activity off of outside of, of their territory um, is something we, like we should have a treaty about it. <laughs> we should have governments talking to each other. The conversation should include things like trade ministries and ministries of state. Like there, there are so many telecom ministries. There are so many serious governmental interests involved here. But instead, for lack of that process, we have individual courts deciding international enforcement questions sort of in one-off cases under very specific fact patterns. And that's a, not a good way to get to where I think we all wish we could be. Yeah, and maybe just one more small comment is that, of course, now a lot of those decisions are made by private companies, and that's another sort of, you know, uh, concern for a lot of people. All right, I'm going to try to get to some more questions because they do keep coming in. Uh, Amelie Coulette asks, what is the best way for the EU to make sure those two legislations really focus on addressing the core issues, proliferation of illegal content, unfair competitive practices, etc.? And therefore make sure there are no loopholes for gatekeeper large platforms to exploit, while at the same time preserving innovation and the competitiveness of digital services, which is much broader than the big B2C platforms and support the EU's ambitions in cloud, AI, green tech, biotech, et cetera. Well, that's a million dollar question, no? Like, so I think, I think one, one thing is about like the proposals actually on the table doing like evaluating those and then, you know, like, the, but the second point is about, you know, what is the political process going to, to lead to, you know, and I think, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine any, any kind of real big political interest not being implicated, uh, you know, by these proposals, you know, in a, in a kind of platform economy, platform society situation uh, that we have ended up in. Um, this just touches on so much. And, and so... I, I expect that it will be, uh, it could become quite a messy process and it's not, you know, I, I, I really hope, you know, that the most talented rapporteurs in the parliament will do their job. I hope that like the member states will really understand what's at stake and send their best people to be part of the, of the lawmaking process. And, and also like uh, for me, from speaking from an academic perspective, I think there's so much at stake that we should really uh, engage uh, quite actively and massively uh, on these issues. But I, I am, I am also sometimes a little bit worried, you know, like of seeing how, you know, how the sausage is made in in Brussels. So it's not, uh, it, it, it's not a given that uh, that the, what what are clearly should be the priorities end up, uh, you know, being realized in the final what is finally uh, adopted. Thanks. And maybe that's a good reminder to also, sorry, Guillermo, I'm just going to take another question because we just have so many. Um, and also to, to talk about the sauce, sausage being made and the fact that this is not yet finalized. Uh, and also to, to show that I'm not going to be selective in the questions. I'm adding a very critical comment and question from uh, Michael Lynn, who says, to be honest, I'm completely unclear what the DSA will achieve. What's the substance here? I was hoping for a discussion on how concretely the DSA will partake in substantive review of content moderation decisions as Professor Persley has raised. What will be the specific skills of auditors and what specific details will be disclosed in auditing reports to the public? What will be the specific endpoints social media companies need to expose in their APIs and who specifically have access? And what is the publicly disclosed feedback loop to the API access? To be, to be seen, is that the short answer? Details of which uh, the, you know, the depth is just not well, it's like, I mean, what to expect from European regulation. I mean, like for European standards, it's a quite detailed regulation in many ways, you know, like the GDPR is, but like, yeah, many, many details are left uh, to, to other processes. I, it's a bit of, I think, you know, when you look at US legislation in particular, it tends to be really quite detailed. You know, if you compare, you know, like the DMCA, you know, from 1998 with the intermediate liability provisions that are part of it, and you compare that to the e-commerce directive, it basically copies uh, the most important uh, 
uh, liability exceptions from the D, uh, from the DMCA. There's like all these like really crucial details are left out. Details on the possibility of injunctions. Details on the process, because it's European level and it's like a lot of detail is left. Also, it has to be left because there. Are so much flexibility and diversity still in the legal and regulatory systems in Europe. So that is something we, yeah, we, I, I guess you could say that we struggled with that in Europe at times, but it's, a, it's, a, it's really a feature of the European level, like to do it like that, they have to find this kind of balance to, to work at the EU level. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, we should also note that the proposals as they are being discussed now will still be amended. You know, the European Parliament will will uh, amend them and vote on them. Uh, the member states will have their say and then there will be negotiations. So this is the beginning of a process, not the end of a process, to be short. Um, I'm going to add Spencer Guzik's question, who asks, where are key what, sorry, what are key ways in which the DSA will treat free speech rights differently from the US legal regime around free speech? For example, the First Amendment, uh, CDA, as well as the broader cultural understanding of quote unquote free speech in the United States. Are there opportunities for the DSA to influence the debate in the United States and vi vice versa? And how might that best be facilitated? And then he adds, this goes to the Merkel comment that yours referenced, for example. And this is probably the, the you know, the biggest context within which this takes place, this very dominant First Amendment context within which platforms have, you know, been given a lot of space, also having extraterritorial global effects. And now, you know, can, can there be um, a joint approach? Will there be conflicting approaches? Um, Daphne, I'm sure you have thoughts to start with. And then please raise your hands, Guillermo and Joris, if you also want to jump in. Sure. Um you know, Congress in the U.S. is kind of at an impasse or, you know, it has its hands tied uh, with respect to regulating things like disinformation and hate speech because of the First Amendment. And there are a lot of people in Congress who would like to regulate those things. And because they cannot outright ban those, those things, you know, given that they're First Amendment protected speech, um, they are building increasingly intricate legal mechanisms to kind of nudge platforms to just take that stuff down anyway voluntarily, um, which is a terrible way to do government. Um, and so I, I feel like that gap in the US will make the um, EU legislation that much more important, um, both just because it will occupy the field and it will be easier for, for platforms to apply its standards globally, as long as they're affordable standards. Um, and for many in DC, that will be a relief. And for others in DC, that will be extremely offensive, you know? And, and so maybe at some point that we will get a US Republican backlash saying like, why are these repressive EU speech standards being used in my country? And, you know, what can I do about it? Um, so that's kind of my big picture sense on, on how it will play out as to the specific differences of sort of what is um, legal here and potentially can be uh, criminalized or, or made a basis for civil liability in the EU. Um, possibly the, the European speakers can, can speak to that more, but you know, it certainly includes things like hate speech. Do you want to add something you also should I go to the next question? I mean I'm also curious about what the others think but I think I think there's the potential around these issues in Europe to create a new form of polarization and politics uh, that we haven't really seen kind of materialize yet so where really the right uh, uh, it takes a particular kind of very strong position on speech uh, issues uh, in the DSA uh, proposals um, and um, you know, I think, you know, over, I don't think we have seen that really kind of a very strong free, freedom of expression uh, in internet regulation uh, lobby on speech rights uh, from, from, from the more right wing uh, side of, of the political spectrum. Um, in, in the US, that has kind of materialized over time, you know, with all the kind of the bias and the kind of the, what they consider over removal and and the deplatforming issues uh, that the rights uh, and the extreme rights experience. I expect that will happen in Europe too, and it will it will be a, be an important uh, 
potential important dynamic in, in Brussels too. I mean, to some extent, the arguments for the Polish law come from that direction, I would, I would say. Um, adding to that, as, as do just to quickly add, as do the litigation matters in, in Germany and Italy brought by far right speakers seeking reinstatement on platforms. Thanks. That's a good point. Um, Matthias Ketemann asks, uh, I think, a related question, which is in Germany, a big topic right now is whether and how to apply platforms law to direct communication platforms like telegrams, sorry, telegrams, public forums and channels. Currently, the Justice Ministry does not consider revisiting that SDG, but says that this is an issue that the DSA should take up. But does it? Uh, should it? Can we re legally and conceptually split the public and private side of Telegram and others? Okay. So, nobody uh, else. I'll, I'll, I'll give two cents on that. Um, on the second question, because on the first one, I won't dare because I'm not an expert on NetsDG, but having worked on European telecom law for a number of years, I think the answer to your last question would be yes, we can definitely split um, the different functions of one same company service into what legally is a definition that defines that specific sort of subservice and apply different obligations uh, to that. In European telecoms law, you already have what is called very funnily um, um, number independent communication services, which means those are communication services that are not based on a SIM card. So you can still talk to people even if they take out the SIM card and obligations apply to those. Uh, so in that sense, um, Telegram would have to comply with a number of obligations there. And then if the DSA wanted and the provided that the public facing function of Telegram falls into a definition into the DSA, then there could be different obligations there. I don't see why not. I, I, have, I have some additional uh, comments on this too. It's a really terrific uh, question it's, and it's a really big, uh, big issue. So this, the DSA is currently uh, probably like, it will have to tackle this, uh, these problems, um, uh, but also the e-privacy uh, directive or the e-privacy regulation, which is still being discussed, uh, also tackle, deals with this problem. Uh, so, uh, and e-privacy is like, so that's privacy and confidentiality in communications. Uh, and, and that is part of the telecommunications framework. So we have regulations of telecommunications, which now in Europe, which now include so-called over the top services, you know, which are all the, all the types of messaging services. And, and, and they have been added to the mix, but the, the obligations in that, the regulatory framework are telco type of obligations. There are some consumer protection, what you can expect, you know, from these uh, companies, and there's a bunch of competition rules, but there's no uh, illegal content uh, rules in, in that. That is slowly changing with the e-privacy regulation. What is on the table is to move some content regulation issues, especially for the more egregious forms of illegal content, uh, child sexual abuse material to move those considerations into you know the e-privacy into the telecommunications framework and um, there's pressure on that also in particular because you know regulators and we as the public also see as large some like social media dynamics and internet they make moving into those kind of private uh, channels and you know regulators are very concerned about that so but of course there's good reasons to push back on top of that, you know, telecommunication services, like for instance, you know, your internet broadband service provider, your connection to the internet, which is regulated on the telecommunications rules, they're going to be able, you know, like to invoke some of the intermediary liability exemptions that are part of the DSA. And they may have to, you know, like also comply with some of the uh, standards. Um, to, the, to make the dividing line of where things are private and public is not so easy. And it's also a problem in the uh, difference between mere conduit and hosting, you know, where you would say, normatively speaking, the private communications platform should be in the mere conduit category because they shouldn't touch the communications of their users. They may actually be hosting the communications because that's how it's technically organized. And then it's possible then for them also to remove stuff. You know, so there's just a lot of messiness in those categories and the pressure is really also on those kind of, yeah, definitely on those more private services to, to fall under more uh, uh, stringent obligations. 
Thank you. We're we're already coming close to the hour again, but I wanted to ask um, two sort of final questions from the participants and allow you to to give a broader answer, each three of you. Uh, Jean-Claude Goldenstein asks, who are the key DSA experts from Europe and the US that are inspiring US regulators, for example, about containing disinformation? So is there, um, you know, transatlantic um, expertise exchange going on? Uh, and then uh, Jana Guth asks, what would be some progressive measures that you think are still missing in the proposals? Uh, mentioning, for example, circuit breakers, prohibition of micro-targeting, et cetera. So we've gone into quite a bit of detail about, you know, how it may play out, uh, where we are in the legislative process, uh, what concerns are from different stakeholders, but what are missed opportunities or rooms for improvement altogether? And uh, who are people that are also reaching across the Atlantic to influence American regulators? In terms of influence on American regulators, I think they are um, sadly very, very inattentive to what's going on in Europe. We see, keep seeing bills introduced to amend um, CDA 230 and other US laws that have no concept of like notice and takedown, having a process or having different rules for technical intermediaries at different parts of the you know, the stack, ISPs versus AW, Amazon Web Services versus Facebook. Um, and so I, I wish there were a better flow of information. Um, <laughs> I've published an op-ed on this in The Hill. Chris Riley from R Street has, Susan Ness, former FCC commissioner. Uh, they seem to have had no impact in Congress. Um, the German Marshall Fund in DC has a couple of experts who I think kind of function as a conduit. Um, but beyond that, I just don't see nearly enough information flow in that direction. Guillermo, any thoughts? Sure. So um, in terms of uh, sort of information flows, what we at OSF are looking at is how can we enable civil society, information flows within civil society working in the US and in the EU and also in other parts of the world to talk to each other. And like I said last time, also to try and make sure that we bring the perspective of those communities in other parts of the world who are somehow directly or indirectly as a second order effect gonna be affected by these rules and bring their interests to their conversations as well. In terms of the question on the progressive, other progressive measures, I really like the fact that um, circuit breakers were mentioned because that's an idea we've been thinking about as well. And there's no, um, I don't think there's anything in the DSA right now that we that specifically points at that idea, but especially then the prohibition on micro-targeting, just to point out that the European Commission has another public consultation now out until early April, I think, about a, a new legislative proposal it's working on, on sponsored political content. And there it is thinking whether or not it should have uh, sort of put out new rules on limiting micro-targeting in, in one way or the other. Um, huge question. Uh, obviously, the jury is out there about what would be the scope, what would be the effect, what would, in which instances this would uh, kick in. Uh, but that conversation is happening. And then just leave to, to leave the conversation with one last thought. I think the other, um, the, the, the other progressive measure that is missing in the DMA specifically is that, um, and this relates to a question that was uh, asked before, the DMA is very clearly focused on the relationship between big gatekeepers and market actors working inside the markets they control. It's not about the user. The DSA is both about the market, society, and the user. The DMA is just about the market. It's not about the user. So the question is, how do we take a lot of, of, of the uh, detailed rules in the DMA and put in some more concepts that bring in that user perspective. And then overarching it all, which there were questions about this, but we didn't zoom in that much, is the enforcement structure of both, um, of both proposals. And for me here, this is a personal opinion, but one of the uh, opportunities missed, at least for now, is that the EU has a very complex enforcement structure and it is its weak spot, as we've seen, not just with the GDPR, but also with how there are different bodies of law with different regulatory networks uh, often at national level that not, don't always interact well with each other. And they are after all looking at the same companies um, from different angles. And now the DSA and the DMA come and add another layer on top. Like we, we have not 
solved the already existing mess and now we're creating another layer on top. So I think we, I hope that the EU institutions will be able to look at the bigger picture and solve that enforcement question. Thank you, Joris. Well, I think I mentioned the, the, the first round uh, of this that, that, that I think there was some missed opportunities around like the intermediary liability, the safe harbors, you know, the basics around that. Uh, I think the, the proposal adopts a bit too uncritically some of the, you know, what, what the Court of Justice in Luxembourg has, uh, has developed. And, and I, I don't think that, uh, I don't think the Commission was brave enough in, in, in rethinking uh, some of this and, and, and thinking through, you know, what are the different types of intermediaries and what are their particular kind of functions and roles and, and what does that mean from an intermediary liability and also responsibility perspective. It's all thrown in this kind of hosting, you know, no category. And then, you know, with the kind of, are you very big or even bigger approach, you know, like you get a bunch of responsibility attached uh, to your operations. Uh, so that is, uh, that is one. And it is really at the, at the basic. So it's really quite crucial, legally really quite crucial. Um, so another point that I, I think, but it's, but it's, it's really a, it's a mechanism to, dis, to, to acknowledge something that I mentioned earlier in response to the question about the Trump and the kind of political dynamics around this. I think the DSA had, needs to have mechanisms, you know, that departure from country of origin principle that, that acknowledge, you know, the very real kind of uh, national you know, member state interest in dealing with some of the kind of big impacts that platforms can have in their societies. And I think that uh, mechanism, I don't really see it yet uh, so much. I think it's very painful for, for Europe to acknowledge that we're not as fully harmonized yet, you know, that we, you know, we can just not get rid of that and have like, I really do think we need national interfaces with, with, with large platforms on, on really big kind of crucial issues. And I'm, I'm missing a little bit that, uh, that mechanism yet. And, and so I, I'm a bit worried that we all play out ultimately also in the in in the process, you know, like and and without that kind of you know without some solution being there, it's a bit unpredictable what what that would lead to. Thank you so much, all three of you, for joining us once more to go deeper into the questions of what the Digital Services Act might bring us. Uh, we managed to answer 19 questions. You did, uh, the three of you, Guillermo, Daphne, and yours. Thank you. But I also realized there are still six open. So um, hopefully you can find us again for our own modest contributions to the information exchange. If I look at the participants, it looks like you're coming from different parts of the world, and that's always exciting. Uh, and I'm just going to do a short pitch for the new program we launched today from Stanford High, which is an executive education course for public officials and leaders, politicians in North America and Europe, where they can learn more about technology in order to um, have better informed policy making, essentially. And this is free of cost for participants, which I'm happy about, and I can also say it's not tech sponsored. So hooray! Um, look at the at the um, at the link for those who are interested, or if you want to nominate somebody, and hopefully you will join us again for our frequent webinar series. Um, there will be a slide up with which the next one will be. Uh, and before we all go, thank you, be well, and a special thanks to our panelists and the team, Michelle and David, who work behind the scenes to make these webinars run very smoothly. <laughs>